Hi, everyone. Nice to see everybody. I'm John Cavadini, director of the Institute for Church Life. And I'm so pleased to be able to welcome you th this morning. This is the first lecture in what's now the seventh year of our Institute for Church Life series, Saturdays with the Saints. Friends, I wrote that down. <laughs> who are the saints? The saints are those who stretch our imagination. They nourish our imagination by interpreting the mystery of the Christian faith with the medium not of text or speech, at least not in the first instance, but with the medium of their lives. The saints emerge from church life, from the life of the church. But the saints do not belong to the church alone. The saints are for all people. How could it be otherwise, since God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son? The church is ordered toward the world, reflecting Christ, the light of the world. The saints, by their witness to Christ's love and compassion, are each instances of this light. Contemplating their lives, we're seeing a light that transcends the world for the sake of the world. A light meant to help us see our way to faith, hope, and love against the temptations of darkness to violence, despair, and contempt that can sometimes see so pervasive in the world. So friends, our lecture series recalls the way in which in Jewish and Christian tradition, Saturday, the ancient Sabbath, because it was the day of rest, was seen as a foretaste of the rest that the saints enjoy in the kingdom of heaven. In other words, eternal life will be an eternal Saturday with the saints. <laughs> and that means that our humble lecture series is an anticipation of eternal life. And how many other lecture series at this university or anywhere else can claim, make that claim? <laughs> blessed be the most holy trinity. Blessed be God and his angels and his saints. So now, friends, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. <laughs> <I've> <laughs> Thank you for laughing. I've already introduced him, actually. So without further ado, then. The mystery of St. Joseph in the memory of the church. A colleague, and I hasten to say not from the theology department, once asked me who was my favorite saint. I, when I responded, St. Joseph, he seemed utterly taken aback and exclaimed, but we don't know anything about him. How can he be anybody's favorite saint? There was a lot implied in my colleague's astonished response. And fair enough, considered from the point of view of bare facts about St. Joseph's life, we don't have much to go on. Granting for the moment that there can actually be such a thing as a bare fact about anyone's life. But how many such facts does one really need in order to find a person, even on the horizontal plane of life on this earth, so attractive that one wants to befriend them. You don't need a lengthy CV at hand to be able to strike up a friendship with someone and to feel one's life inestimably enriched thereby. The dimensions of personal attractiveness are not easily reduced to bare facts about their life. Perhaps, too, a mutual friend or a trusted advisor has introduced you providing a few essential indications of character as the basis for a possible friendship. In such a scenario, the trustworthiness of the friend or advisor introducing you is part of the appeal of the prospective friend. Even more, the perspective of the mutual friend is already a factor in the potential friendship and may continue as an important part of the friendship as it develops. In the case of St. Joseph, the trustworthy friend in the analogy is the church. And the introduction provided 
is a set of memories of St. Joseph preserved in Scripture. These memories belong to the church as to a kind of personal subject. The church is, in a way, a collective person, the people of God, whom Benedict XVI calls a collective subject, in fact, the living subject of Scripture, meaning by subject, the one who's remembering. He says that the scripture emerged from within the heart of a living subject, the pilgrim people of God, and lives within the same subject. The individual authors of the biblical books form part of this collective subject. Who, he continues, is the deeper author of the scriptures on the human level. Later on, Benedict explains how this works using the fourth gospel as a specific example. And here's a quote. On the one hand, the author of the fourth gospel gives a very personal accent to his own remembrance. He even identifies himself in the narrative. On the other hand, it is never a merely private remembering, but a remembering in and with the we of the church. That which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands. With John, the subject who remembers is always the we. He remembers in and with the community of disciples, in and with the church. However much the author stands out as an individual witness, the remembering subject that speaks here is always the we of the community of disciples, the we of the church." End quote. He goes to, on to add, quote, because the personal recollection that provides the foundation of the gospel is purified and deepened by being inserted in the memory of the church, it does indeed transcend the banal recollection of bare facts. Of course, it is important to remember that the memory of the church, insofar as these memories are contained in scripture, is inspired. And Benedict puts it this way. This people does not exist alone, Rather, it knows that it is led and spoken to by God himself, who, through human beings and their humanity, is at the deepest level the one speaking." End quote. <clears throat> Scriptural memories are, as it were, definitive memories in the overall remembering of the church that com com comprises apostolic tradition. The main content of this memory is, of course, the mystery of Christ, the Word made flesh, as Dei Verbum, the Vatican II document on Revelation, sums it up, quote, it pleased God in his goodness and wisdom to reveal himself and to make known the mystery of his will, which was that people should have access to the Father through Christ, the Word made flesh, in the Holy Spirit, and thus become sharers in the divine nature. End quote. The most intimate truth thus revealed about God and human salvation shines forth for us in Christ, who is himself both the mediator and the sum total of revelation. That's actually the end of the quote, sorry. Jesus completed and perfected revelation, and everything to do with his presence and his manifestation of himself was involved in achieving this. His works and words, signs and miracles, but above all, his death and glorious resurrection from the dead, and finally, his sending of the spirit of truth. Everything in Christ's life, in other words, participates in the mystery of his person that sums up Revelation. As the Catechism puts it, quote, Christ's whole life is mystery. From the swaddling clothes of his birth to the vinegar of his passion and the shroud of his resurrection, everything in Jesus' life was a sign of his mystery, end quote. So that's a long introduction but it's a way of situating the, mem the scriptural memories that we have about St. Joseph as memories within the mystery of the Word made flesh. It goes without saying that St. Joseph is very much implicated in such a statement, Christ's whole life is mystery. To acquire a friendship with St. Joseph, therefore means, if it is authentic, a deeper acquaintance with the mystery of the Lord. And the more intimate the friendship with St. Joseph, the deeper the appreciation of the mystery of the Incarnation. 
The reverse is also true. The more one has accepted the invitation of revelation to become friends with the Lord Jesus and through him the Father, the greater possibility there is for an intimate and living friendship with St. Joseph in Christ. For the whole of St. Joseph's life and identity is saturated with the mystery of Christ. And the mystery of St. Joseph and the memory of the church is constituted wholly by its reference to the all-encompassing mystery of Christ which it reflects. Why don't we take the recommendation of our trusted advisor, the church, and strike up a friendship with St. Joseph? Here we go. Though it is spare enough in detail, what is authoritatively remembered under the guidance of the Holy Spirit is overwhelmingly sufficient as the basis for an intimate and satisfying friendship. The two infancy narratives of St. Matthew, Matthew and St. Luke are notoriously different from each other to the point of potential, if not actual, conflict. I regard the difference between the two narratives as uncomfortable as it can feel for those who would like an easy reconciliation between them as absolutely providential. For it shows that these two narratives are independent traditions, and yet, astonishingly, they agree on the most essential points, among which happen to be included the most unlikely points, namely, that Mary and Joseph were husband and wife, but that before they began to live together as husband and wife, during their betrothal, an angel announced in one narrative to Joseph and the other narrative to Mary the conception of Jesus, which, in addition, was said to have taken place through the Holy Spirit without intercourse between Mary and Joseph or indeed between Mary and any other man. It is interesting, at least, that even the Gospel of Mark, which doesn't have an infancy narrative, when it does not identify Jesus as the son of anyone but God, also says simply that he is the carpenter, the son of Mary. In other words, he doesn't say he's the son of the carpenter. He simply identifies himself as the carpenter. So it's unusual to identify someone only by their mother and not by their father. These points of agreement are anything but bare facts, though they are claims on historical truth. Such matters as the virginal conception of Jesus or the appearance of angels in dreams or otherwise cannot even in principle be historically verified. And yet the independence of the two inspired traditions, so clearly independent of each other, does verify that these memories are as ancient as any there are about Jesus and are not simply the fabrications of the evangelists who are carrying them forward. They are as likely or as unlikely, I suppose you could say, as the truth of the word made flesh, as the truth of the incarnation itself, for they are the essential elements of the location of the incarnation in place and time. The incarnation is thus distinguished from myth, for it is located in place and time. And yet it is not reduced to mere history, if there is any such thing. For it was initiated outside of history, and its significance transcends history. Between myth and history, we find myth, no, did I say that right? Oh, I blew it. <laughs> Between myth and history, we find mystery. And for all the special significance of our developing friendship with St. Joseph, all friendships are located in an analogous domain of mystery, aren't they? For the interior essence of someone's truly historically located love is never simply reducible to its location in history nor yet does that make it an account of a myth, even an ordinary friendship. The Gospels do not tell us much about what Joseph thought about all of this. The Gospels aren't a psychodrama. <laughs> they do not give us an account of what today we might call Joseph's psychology. But the Gospel of Matthew does evoke an image of a man with a rich interior life, intent on doing God's will, and always on the lookout for indications of God's will and ready to obey. Matthew recounts that Joseph was disturbed by the discovery that Mary was pregnant. 
and considered divorcing her, though we are not told whether this was because he thought she must have been unfaithful or that he was already aware that some mystery larger than human devising had entered Mary's life, in which he was not sure of his further place. The way that the, the, way that the story is told, and if we had a moment I could show you, doesn't, people assume that Joseph thinks he was, she was unfaithful, but that's, that's not actually the necessary conclusion from the narrative. Matthew tells us that as a righteous or just man, he decided to divorce her following the law, the best indication of God's will that he knew, the law, yet quietly, yielding the benefit of the doubt in so doing to Mary or to God or to both, as the Proto-Evangelium of James seems to suggest. In obeying the law quietly, Joseph is obeying both its letter and its spirit, Divorcing Mary, not as a public vindication of his own person, but as a refusal to claim that he knows God's intentions fully, and an openness to what they might actually be. In this, the evangelist is saying, does his righteousness, or we could translate sanctity, essentially consists, this openness, giving the benefit of the doubt to God's will. We can see this is true to Matthew's intentions, what I've just said. For when the angel reassures him in a dream that he should take Mary into his home, he does so without any hesitation. The Gospel of Luke, for its part, does not register even a protest, worry, worry or anxiety on behalf of Joseph. And we might begin to think that he's kind of an afterthought, merely a narrative or dramatic prop were it not that the Gospel of Luke indicates his lively involvement in his family's life as husband and father up to and past Jesus' 12th year, a sustained involvement as a father described with more detail than that of any other father in the Gospel of Luke. Maybe the father of Jairus, who pleads for the, for the raising of his daughter, is a suggestive second. And I'm not counting the fathers who are characters in parables. Luke privileges the reflective pondering of Mary instead of Joseph's, which Matthew privileges, and provides explicit memories of the thoughts and sayings that proceed from her pondering and return her to it. But Luke is careful to point out that the angel's annunciation is to Mary, a virgin who was betrothed, and betrothed explicitly to Joseph. Thus, while Joseph is not consulted, Neither, he is, neither is he just an also-ran who happens along at some random point in time, collected by the side of the road. It is not Mary alone, but Mary as betrothed who is addressed. And so her marriage to Joseph is part of the divine plan for the incarnation, not incidental. And in this matter, the Gospels of Matthew and Luke agree though they bring out the point each in their own way. Neither gospel is so indiscreet as to try to reproduce the conversations between Mary and Joseph about their marriage and their vocation. Although if you read around in the literature of St. Joseph, you'll find out that a lot of it is not that discreet. They must have discerned it together in some manner unique to themselves. The gospel's reticence on this point, in a way, verifies that this domain is truly spousal, truly intimate, and not for public view. Jesus enters this world embraced in an intimacy which, if not physical, is nevertheless truly spousal. It is important that we know that both Mary and Joseph are not simply passive instruments of God's will. And each evangelist implies this for one of them and verifies it for the other. God's will is accomplished in their free acceptance of it and in the bond of marital intimacy, which is sealed in shared obedience to God's will. In the case of Joseph, the two gospel accounts converge in portraying Joseph as having no terms for his involvement as husband and father accept the terms God offers, and they seem paltry enough. 
He has promised no seed, as Abraham was. Nor, more, more poignantly, since he, he is in the line of David, as David was. And though Mary is his betrothed, in neither account is Joseph even consulted about her pregnancy. Yet once he is sure it is, you know, that would bother me, actually. <laughs> if that were my wife, I don't care if you're God. It's like, that's my, that's my wife. You could ask me. <laughs> that's why the gospel doesn't say John betrothed to Mary. <laughs> Yet once he is sure it is God's will, he takes his place as her intended husband. He understands she does not thereby become his property, nor for that matter does he think he's his own private property. He becomes a husband and a father in dialogue with God's law in its fullest dimension. He is depicted as someone whose exercise of husbandhood and fatherhood, and therefore of manhood, since these offices are exclusively those of a man, yield him no claims that he cares to exact on his own behalf. He rather exercises these offices of his manhood as instances of complete openness to God's will, without fanfare or display. And yet he is no less a man and in fact, one could argue that he is the Bible's most explicit revelation of what it means to be a man. For St. Joseph's identity is completely coincident with his roles as husband and father, without remainder. And as noted, these can be fulfilled only by a man. We are not informed by the Gospels as to whether Joseph's terms had included an expectation of sexual intercourse with Mary at some point or indeed what Mary thought about it, though we are given some clues. Mary's protest that she does not know man implies something more than simply that she had not yet had sex. Because as the Old Testament shows, and as the example of her kinswoman Elizabeth shows, God is perfectly capable of working a miraculous or otherwise wondrous conception through marital intercourse. And so the common sense answer to Mary's question would be that through future sex with her husband Joseph, God would raise up the Savior. Her question seems to verify the angel's description of her as full of grace, because she seems to be fully open to a possibility within God's domain that would go beyond what she has or could have glimpsed. Another possibility, openness, sorry, another possibility perhaps undiscerned as yet even by Mary. This, oddly enough, tallies with the corresponding openness we have seen in St. Joseph, implied in Luke and specified in Matthew, who furthermore goes to the trouble of making it explicit that Joseph did not engage with sex with Mary before or during Mary's pregnancy, even though by that time, that is during the pregnancy, it would not have been forbidden. The Gospels do not mention anything explicit beyond this but they do make it clear that the sex life of Mary and Joseph was something intimately relative to the mystery of the overarching designs of God in the birth of Jesus, and that Mary and Joseph both came to understand this would involve a unique degree of renunciation or bypassing of married sex. The Gospels allow them to continue their discernment unobserved by the reader as part and parcel of pondering the dimensions of the uniqueness of their marriage. The gospel ask of us, the church, the same attitude of openness towards the uniqueness of this marriage. The clues provided, it seems to me, justify the ancient discernment of the church that these spouses never had sex and that this renunciation was part of the trueness of their true but unique marriage rather than militating against it. The Proto-Evangelium of James, an apocryphal text usually dated to around 145 AD, testifies to the antiquity of belief 
in the perpetual virginity of Mary. And contrary to the insults often heaped on this text, all you have to do is read around in New Testament criticism, and this text comes up as the butt of a lot of jokes. Not only does this text proclaim the doctrine, but it also cautions against an overly hasty assumption about what it might mean. The birth of Jesus in this text takes place in the midst of an obscuring heavenly light so that its exact character cannot be ascertained. The midwife, Salome, puts her hand to the flesh of Mary to see if her hymen is intact, a gesture reminiscent of that of doubting Thomas in the Gospel of John and so indicating that the doctrine is in some sense tied to the mystery of the new creation in Christ and the resurrection. She does discover that Mary's hymen is intact, and yet as a result, her hand withers. <laughs> it's like, you put that in the wrong place now. <laughs> Though it is immediately healed. She is not judged harshly but just harshly enough to allow the reader to see that though it is true, the reader should be warned against assuming he or she has or could fully grasp the mystery of the childbearing of the virgin, a physical truth, yet like the resurrection itself, not fully reducible or even specifiable fully in its physical dimensions. Karl Rahner's warning to the reader in his, in his, in his book, some 1,800 years later, is fully congruent with this text. So to put Karl Rahner on the side of the um, Proto-Evangelium of James might seem an unlikely juxtaposition, but, <laughs> but I think it's true. Famously, the Proto-Evangelium of James also depicts St. Joseph as an elderly widower, fully conscious of how ridiculous it would look for him to seem to be in the position of Mary's husband. It will look as though he were so lustful that he could not, although he had already had a long life and family, resist the attraction of another new young wife. This is the Proto-Evangelium's solution to the seeming counter-evidence to the perpetual virginity of Mary, namely the mention of the brothers of Jesus in the Gospels. In this text, the Proto-Evangelium, Joseph is afraid of disobeying God and so receives Mary and puts up with looking foolish. And this solution has persisted in the Eastern church and iconography. So you'll often see in Eastern iconography, Joseph is depicted as an older man. If you see the classical Eastern icons of the flight to Egypt, you'll see um, Joseph leading the donkey with Mary on it and another guy, young guy, that's one of Joseph's sons from a previous marriage. So the Eastern church pretty much takes this solution. Without commenting on his age, Origen accepts as settled doctrine the perpetual virginity of Mary, and consequently that Joseph's sons by an earlier marriage are the brothers of Jesus through Joseph. In modern times, this theory has, with modifications, been accepted by writers as diverse as Elizabeth Johnson and Gerald Kleba, who both depict Joseph as a widower with children, but a young one, in his late 20s or maybe early 30s thus bypassing the later objection of St. Jerome, who insisted that Joseph could not credibly pass as Mary's husband, if elderly, and Jerome then suggested that he was a virgin. This suggestion was accepted by St. Augustine, and it came to be the dominant position in the West. It is especially beautifully treated in John Paul II's evocation of the mystery of St. Joseph, Custos Domini, Contemporary iconography that depicts St. That depicts Joseph as a young man has Jerome to thank for it. For Jerome's case to work, however, the word for brother in Greek must be taken to be flexible enough to refer to more distant relations or to reflect a Semitic idiom that was that flexible. This was Jerome's position. Contemporary scholarship actually exhibits a sharp division on this matter and it's doubtful that it can ever be conclusive one way or another. The benefit of the doubt actually works in favor of the tradition here, if you're willing to give it. 
it's odd that the most recent trenchant defense of the narrow, um, the narrow meaning of the word brother is argued by a Catholic priest. And the most trenchant defense of the elasticity of the word brother in the Gospels is argued by a very prominent evangelical um, scholar. We have seen how the Proto-Evangelium of James receives the mystery of St. Joseph in the memory of the church. And now I'd like to turn to the next earliest contributor, that, and that would be Origen, Origen of Alexandria, who spanned second and third century. And I'm doing this because a lot of people say, and it's true in a sense, that devotion to St. Joseph doesn't really get off the ground until the, until the 14th century. Um, but it's not actually true that there hasn't been some sustained reflection on St. Joseph, even in the early church. And Origen is the best example, so that's why I'm focusing on him. In his homilies on Luke, Origen comments on Luke 126 to 27, again, I turn the matter over in my mind and ask why when God had decided that the Savior should be born of a virgin, he chose not a girl who was not betrothed, but precisely one who was already betrothed. So Origen is a very careful exegete. Origen tells us he found the key to understanding this in a letter of St. Ignatius of Antioch, the martyr, uh, who was martyred in the year 112. He says, I found an elegant statement in the letter of a martyr. I mean Ignatius, the second bishop of Antioch after Peter. During a persecution, he fought against the wild animals at Rome. He stated, Mary's virginity escaped the notice of the ruler of this world. That's the sentence quoted from Ignatius. We just did this in class. <laughs> Ignatius had commented in, in the letter that Origen is quoting that there were three secrets wrought in God's silence, he says, and kept hidden from the prince of this world, namely the virginity of Mary, her childbearing, and the death of the Lord. Ignatius is taking up a Pauline theme. See how the memories continue? He's taking up a Pauline theme, namely the essential hiddenness of the mystery of the incarnation as part of a logic or wisdom that is not of this world. Origen brings out this Pauline logic as he comments on this sentence from Ignatius. The apostle maintains, Paul maintains, or Origen says, that the opposing powers were ignorant of the Lord's passion. He writes, we speak wisdom among the perfect, but not the wisdom of this age or the wisdom of the rulers of this age. They are being destroyed. We speak God's wisdom, hidden in a mystery, None of the rulers of this age knows it. If they had known it, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 8. The logic of the incarnation, in other words, is not a logic of this world. It's not a logic of manifest credentialing, of rhetorical leverage, of intimidating erudition, of powerful status. <laughs> Origen reminds his hearers, that in the temptation scenes in the gospel, and there's a lot of deep insight here into the temptation scene, the Savior never revealed to the devil that he was the Son of God, refusing to yield to the temptation precisely of pulling rank, of reducing himself to the logic or wisdom of this world, as it were, and though, as though his status, qua status, would conquer the devil, like all he'd have to say is, yeah, I am the Son of God, and the devil would fall dead. But if he said, if he fell into the temptation, the devil would actually have won because he's relying on status, on the logic of this world. He won't play the devil's game, but is operating according to another wisdom of which, according to Christ's will, as Origen points out, the devil was kept ignorant. The devil, relying on the logic of this world, was waiting for someone to find bragging irresistible to pull rank, to rely on status as status, for that itself would be his victory. They're coming out into the light or logic of the wisdom of this age by which he can see them. The devil, Origen comments, is fickle and perverted. 
his malice so great that he can't see someone unless that person accepts the terms of his malice. This means, too, that the mystery of Christ, even when fully revealed, remains a mystery. It's wisdom irreducibly hidden in mystery, resisting and rejecting the logic of this world and its prince. At any rate, Origen locates St. Joseph and his marriage to Mary squarely within the logic of hiddenness, intrinsic to the mystery of the Incarnation. There is a discreet beauty here in the providence of God. In a way, there is nothing so hidden, both in the sense of unobservable and in the sense of unremarkable or ordinary, as the conception of a child in the intimacy of a married couple. It is just here, in the bosom of this intimacy, that the mystery of the Incarnation was hidden, in the conjugal intimacy shared by a righteous man and a woman full of grace. Origen comments, quote, Mary's virginity escaped the notice of the ruler of this age. It escaped his notice because of Joseph and because of their wedding. If she had not been betrothed or not had a husband, her virginity could never have been concealed from the ruler of this age. Immediately, a silent thought would have occurred to the devil. How can this woman, who has not slept with a man, be pregnant? This conception must be divine. It must be something more sublime than human nature. Devil's thoughts. The devil is on the lookout for status claims, for achievements or wonders bragged about. And yet all he sees is the intimacy of a married couple, to him, boringly human and ordinary. But it's not just a show that is, Joseph's like a placeholder. The devil is not fooled by show. In fact, he is known for pomp and for lies. The virginity is truly hidden in this intimacy because it is not a limit or a block. The virginity is truly hidden in this intimacy because this virginity is not a limit or a block to intimacy, but the very substance of Mary and Joseph's deeply shared conjugal intimacy. It's not an ascetical purity that Mary has worked at and Joseph doesn't dare stain, an achievement that stands as something more sublime than human nature and aloof from real contact. The devil would notice that right away. To dwell as Origen does for the length of this whole homily on why the angel came to a girl who was betrothed is to insist that the word made flesh was conceived in a true marital intimacy of husband and wife and most safely hidden by God there. Ignatius comments that the secret of God, as he puts it, emerges from the great silence of God. And though Origen does not quote this part of the sentence, he sees to it that St. Joseph is the carrier, as it were, of this silence which continues to cling to the mystery as hidden. St. Joseph has no terms and offers to no one account of his life. He accepts a fatherhood that is not a fatherhood, becomes a father in renouncing a natural paternity, and allows the designation father to be used of him without advertising that his is a very special case. That's what I'd be doing. <laughs> I'd be saying, oh, you think I'm just an ordinary father? Well, I got to tell you. And everybody would say to him, yeah, get in line with all these other guys who think their kid's the son of God. <laughs> I bet you think your wife's the Virgin Mary. <laughs> His silence, St. Joseph's, marks the intimacy of total self-gift, and one could say even self-immolation, into a paternity he cannot brag about, and an identity of which he can give no account except to and in the heart of Mary, his wife. But this, in traditional piety, and not without biblical reason, if Ignatius and Origen are reading correctly, makes him not the image, of course, but the shadow of the Eternal Father, whose identity is dark and unknowable, because it consists in the complete effacement of identity that is the begetting of the Son. Like a supracosmic black hole, of which St. Joseph is the visible shadow. 
But what is darkness and self-effacement and blankness on the one side of self-immolation is generation and paternal love and affection on the other side towards Jesus. Origen does not neglect the fatherly side of St. Joseph. And we can turn to that briefly, for his remarks can help us understand the sources of devotion to St. Joseph, and ultimately the title of this talk that was advertised, where we will conclude. In homily 17, Origen comments on Luke 2.33, quote, and his father and mother were astonished by the things that were being said about him, end quote. Origen comments that Luke had already made it crystal clear that Jesus was the son of a virgin and was not conceived by human seed. But Luke has also attested that Joseph was his father. That's a quote. Origen then asks, what reason was there that Luke should call him a father when he was not a father? End quote. He goes on to comment that the simple explanation is that the Holy Spirit honored Jesus with the name of, honored Joseph with the name of a father because he had reared Jesus and taken care of him. And Origen does not deny that explanation. He actually reiterates it later in another homily. But he continues, quote, one who looks for a more profound or deeper explanation can say that the Lord's genealogy extends from David to Joseph. Lest the naming of Joseph, who was not the Savior's father, should appear to be pointless, he is called the Lord's father to give him his place in the genealogy, end quote. In other words, if Mary gives the Lord her flesh, Joseph, for his part, provides the Lord with his identity, his place in the line of human history, someone who is not just flesh but has a family identity. The significance of this, apart from verifying his status as son of David, is more apparent if we recall an earlier passage from homily 11, commenting on the census at Bethlehem. Here's a quote. Someone might say, evangelist, how does this narrative help me? How does it help me to know that the first census of the entire world was made under Caesar Augustus? And that among all these people, the name of Joseph, with Mary who was espoused to him and pregnant, was included. And that before the census was finished, Jesus was born, end quote. Origen is pointing out that Luke seems to be relating nothing but a bare historical fact. It seems to contain nothing spiritual. Origen answers his own question almost as if he had read the catechism's statement that Christ's whole life is mystery, every detail, at least as it is recorded in scripture. Origen continues, to one who looks more carefully, a mystery seems to be conveyed. It is significant that Christ should have been recorded in the census of the whole world. He is registered with everyone and sanctified everyone. He was joined with the world for the census and offers the world communion with himself after this census. After this census, he could enroll those from the whole world in the book of the living with himself, end quote. It's Jesus' identity as the son of Joseph that permits Jesus to be enrolled in a particular line of human descent, not in a way that reduces Christ to that line of descent, but in a way that catches all our lines of descent up into a descent derived from Jesus. The most authentic genealogy of all, the book of the living. By refusing to conquer Satan, by revealing his identity as only begotten of the eternal Father, but by emptying that identity into hiddenness, into his identity as Joseph's son, into his place in the genealogy of Joseph, the Savior catches all of our genealogies up into the book of life. In a surprising way, then, think about the significance, friends. The paternity of Joseph through Mary as her husband and in Christ is extended in this way to us. Through his fatherhood, we are all enrolled in the book of life. He is more than a friend. We can call him dad, just as Jesus did. If we want to, we can call him dad, just as Jesus did, if we want to, as the deepest way of evoking the mystery of St. Joseph in the memory of the church. 
And yet when we look back on that fatherhood to try to clarify or objectify or specify it, we see in a way nothing. We see an effacement rather than a claim, a hiddenness rather than an assertion. Silence and not speech, someone easily overlooked, someone of no particular interest. The generous obedience of St. Joseph to the vision of God is astonishing. No one asked him how he felt about his wife's being consulted on an intimate matter affecting their whole married life when he was not, or about raising someone else's kid and giving up his own natural paternity. But his sacrifice and generous obedience to the will of God became a home in this world for Jesus, his legal son, and Mary, his wife, both treasures of divine initiative. They were hidden, as it were, in and by his paternal love, as though by Harry Potter's cloak of invisibility, <laughs> completely concealed from the prince of this world, to whom love is always and wholly invisible. This act submerges Joseph in the profound silence of God itself, as Ignatius calls it. St. Paul says in Colossians 3.3, for you have died and your life is hid with Christ in God. There is something intrinsically hidden about the Christian life. And we see the form of this revealed in advance in St. Joseph. His life, by its very structure, cannot provide an accounting of itself without undoing itself. A mosaic of St. Joseph, commissioned by Pope St. John XXIII, and placed over the side altar in St. Peter's where the Blessed Sacrament is reserved, the only place where there's a tabernacle, in St. Peter's, publicly, uniquely depicts the warmth and beauty of this saint, in my opinion. In the mosaic, Joseph is on his back porch. OK, it's marble, but it's still his back porch. <laughs> <laughs> Hanging out at home. He's holding the child Jesus in his right arm. Jesus is not a month old infant, but looks about two years old. You know how two-year-old kids, when you pick them up, they don't just stay still. They like to try to climb you. This gives Joseph's figure a look of immense strength because he manages to hold such a big active kid on one arm with no trouble. In his left hand, he holds his identifying iconic sign, the staff blooming with the lilies of purity. He holds it a little stiffly as though a neighbor had chanced upon him and asked him to pose for a picture with his son. And so then he does, but then he insists, could you pick that thing up? Insisting Joseph hold the staff too. He is in the middle of taking care of his two-year-old and someone has asked him to pose. But he tolerantly obliges, picks up the baby, and looks at the camera. His face is calm but hardly grave. Rather, even though posing for an annoying family picture, <laughs> his face seems to take it in stride and seems to radiate happiness. It's a face familiar to any dad. Here is the hiddenness of St. Joseph, who accepts the utterly common lot of a dad holding his kid without fanfare, though he is holding the word incarnate and could claim glory and fame. Jesus, for his part, does not pay any attention to the imaginary photographer, but rather seems wholly delighted with his dad. For what on St. Joseph's side, as we pointed out, is a continuous immolation of self-gift is on Jesus' side the brilliant radiance, comfort, and charity of paternal love, the cloak of invisibility, which gives even the word of God a genuine childhood and keeps him hidden from the prince of darkness until it is time for him to confront him alone, armed only with the love he has learned in part from his earthly dad. If, as St. Augustine taught, true sacrifice is always a work of mercy, then St. Joseph's whole fatherhood is rich in mercy. In fact, one great work of mercy that extends all the way to us. Devotion to St. Joseph means that as the genuine mystery of his paternity is revealed to us little by little, we grow up, like his kids, we grow up to accept the form of the Christian life as, in baptism, a hidden one, a death to the noise of the world, and a life in the silence of God, which is nothing other than his eternal love. Thank you.
So thanks, friends. Um, now, we always say we let you out right at 1130, so we only have seven minutes for questions. <laughs> Yes. You suggested at one point that uh, the father, the, the, uh, the, his fatherhood is extended to us. How would that uh, compare with God as our father and Mary as our mother? Can we have two fathers or two fathers yeah. and one mother? Yeah, so that's, that's the interesting thing, isn't it? Um, <laughs> but it, it does reflect the structure of Jesus himself, right? Mary is his mother, his only mother. His true father, his, as he explains to Mary and Joseph after they find him in the temple, is his eternal father. And yet right in that very passage, Luke calls St. Joseph his father. And so the, there's a mystery of paternity there that, that, that means that, be, in a sense, be, because Joseph's fatherhood is not a physical one, And, and because Mary and Joseph didn't have any other children, didn't have any sex, it means that the, the mystery of their marriage is that it's open to all of us. Like, we're their children because we're their children in Christ. And so, in a sense, we can say dad just like Jesus did, even though the eternal father is his father. I love your way of putting it because I'm a father too, but not physically, spiritually. Right. So St. Joseph, Joseph's fatherhood is, I, I would say, the paradigm of fatherhood in a sense, that that um, none of us has a total purchase on, neither natural fathers or spiritual fathers. There's all, his fatherhood is ahead of ours always, and therefore unites us in a way. Because on the one hand, St. Joseph's fatherhood was not physical, so in that sense spiritual. But on the other hand, he actually had a kid that he had to take care of and a real wife that he had to, I mean, a, you know, a woman that he had to, so there's, in each case, there's something that, that everyone has and, and something that someone else doesn't have. The, p the point is, I think he's revealed that way so that the mystery of fatherhood itself can't exhaustively be claimed by any of us, like it's ours. But we have to be open to the fatherhood of someone else who might not have it in the same way we do. Put it that way. Yes? I'll never think of St. Joseph the same way after this. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering if you could shed, I mean, the only uh, uh, inspiration I have had to have any devotion to St. Joseph is because of uh, Teresa of Avila. Absolutely. Well, of course, she attributed her recovery from her mortal illness to St. Joseph. But there's even more than that, I think. Oh, that's a lot. But she said, <laughs> <laughs> she made this famous, she has this famous quote that used to annoy the heck out of me. Um, she said that uh, anyone who doesn't know how to pray should, should um, ask St. Joseph, and he will be their guide. And I used to think, what kind of a spiritual director are you? I mean, you're supposed to be, you're supposed to be like a doctor of the church. And aren't, aren't there like things you have to do to pray or places you have to go or something like that? And you're saying, St. Joseph, that's your solution? <laughs> and then I used to think, well, but John, that's because you, me, think of prayer as a work. Like it's something I have to accomplish. It's something I have to get good at. And something, if I had dared, if I had enough nerve, I'd put on my CV and say that I had attained the height of prayer. Um, and that's actually the biggest obstacle to prayer, is thinking that it's a work that you have to, or a skill. And if you, th if you think about it, if you think about St. Joseph, his whole life, his whole life was a, a long um, renunciation of all kinds of status, all kinds of achievement he could have bragged about. So in a way, thinking about St. Joseph, it's kind of like, it's like thinking about your dad, like not someone necessarily who's a mystic or something like that, but someone whose love was so unassuming, he is of no particular interest in one way. 
But that's when you realize what it means to call him dad. You're thinking about someone who, when you're thinking about him, you're already praying. That's what St. Teresa is saying. So stop thinking of it, John, as some kind of big, like, dramatic thing. You're going to step into it, and lights are going to shine. And you're going to be verified as some kind of holy person, and then put it on your CV and brag about it. Just think of St. Joseph, the guy. I'm not you. I'm talking to myself. <laughs> Maybe one more question. Where? Yes. I mean, that's a great example. I mean, that was a beautiful friendship between St. Andre and, and St. Joseph. And you know, we should think about what does it mean to have a friendship with a saint? Does it mean that we think that there's some kind of parapsychological spiritual world in which we're communicating with a saint somehow? Um, that's not the point. The point is the community of saints is a communion in Christ, right? Christ is the greatest good binding the community of saints into one, and Christ has conquered death. So the community, that's why the community of saints transcends the boundaries of death, because we have communion. It's constituted in the one who did conquer death. And so that's why we are able to have a communion with someone in the church who's died, not because we're psychics or something, but because the communion is in Christ, which conquered death, who conquered death. So friends, we've pretty much come to the end of the hour, and our only remaining duty is to thank our speaker. <laughs> <laughs>